Wild Sea is a tabletop RPG by Felix Isaacs published in 2022 after a successful Kickstarter. It's a completely original setting that puts you in a sort of post-apocalyptic world where a runaway explosion of plant growth has created mile-tall forests across the entire planet, the canopies of which are so thick that the few survivors of the world are actually able to sail atop the trees with special craft that can churn through the foliage. At the time of this recording, the company that published this game, Mythopia, has just rebranded itself as Mythworks and is crowdfunding the first expansion of Wild Sea on Kickstarter called Storm and Root. I'll leave a link below. I want to cut to the chase here. Even though I backed Wild Sea and received the PDF a long time ago, I never got around to even looking at the game until very recently. And when I did, I was completely spellbound. It's one of the most original, mechanically interesting, and well laid out games I've ever come across. And that's pretty much what I'm going to unpack in this video. And just for the record, this video is not sponsored or anything. I just want to share with you how Wild Sea, one, has an incredibly realized and original setting, two, is almost unbelievably illustrated with captivating illustrations, three, is laid out to be just about as readable and reference friendly as one could possibly muster, and four, most importantly, has a unique blend of game mechanics that foster maximum storytelling and fun. I had the fortune of doing a written interview with the author Felix Isaacs and the publisher and co-creator Ray Chow, where they helped me unpack the origin of this game as well as every question I had about the unique mechanics, and the details of Wild Sea's first expansion, Storm and Root. Links for all that are below. I really do encourage you to check out that interview. Felix and Ray were very forthcoming with their thoughts, knowledge, and experience with the game. So there are several striking things about the offset print version of Wild Sea. The first of which is that it comes wrapped in a GM screen made of an absurdly thick sort of dense board paper. The screen itself has a really nice spread of artwork on the outside and the actual information on the inside is all really quite useful and beautifully laid out. I do have one gripe about this screen though. Since it covers the book when in storage, you would hope to see the title of the game replace the title on the spine of the actual book, but alas, you don't get that. So you just get a blob of color when the book is wrapped up on the shelf. As for the actual book, it feels about as primo as a book can get. Cloth outer spine, stitch bound pages, thick covers, really nice quality paper, vibrant colors on each page. It's the sort of quality that I think a lot of RPG people, especially those who back a lot of Kickstarters, have become addicted to. Once you hold and handle books of this quality, it's easy to understand the allure. The most obvious feature about this book that stands out from most RPG books is the fact that it's laid out in landscape orientation. The main drawbacks to this approach are that if you don't have a deep bookshelf, it will stick out if you shelve it bottom side down. Although coincidentally, if you do that, you won't see the title anyway, so you might as well shelve it bottom out. The other drawback is that if you're playing in a physical game, the book tends to take up more precious lateral space in your table area. But that being said, there was a really remarkable thing that happened when I read this horizontally oriented book. It felt a lot more organic to look left and right rather than up and down, which might be a personal thing, I'm not sure. I also tend to really hate vertically oriented videos, which is the only reason why I don't do shorts on this channel. Or maybe the appeal of horizontally oriented books is more of a universal human appeal. The standard for video for decades has now been 16 by nine because the human eye is better at perceiving that window of vision rather than a four by three box. Whatever the case, I was really drawn into this book in part by the landscape orientation. It made the information jump out at me a little bit more and just felt like a better reading experience. So all right, onto the setting of this game. As the story goes, some 300 years ago, the civilizations of the world collapsed almost overnight when a runaway explosion of plant life consumed almost the entire surface of the planet. Every surface below a mile in altitude became subsumed in greenery, while mountaintops remained as islands of land. Before I go any further, it's worth noting that this isn't necessarily Earth we're talking about. The setting leaves a lot of unanswered questions for your table to answer. The only questions that are answered for you are, one, the world had and still has humans. Two, there was a level of technology equivalent to about the middle of the 20th century when everything hit the fan. And three, in this world, the concept of souls, spirits, and ghosts are very real. The ghosts thing is the closest the setting comes to magic. As for the trees, they are a mile tall and endless. 
and their canopies bunch up together at the top so densely that people in the past three centuries have devised ways of traveling across them on ships large and small. The people crazy enough to do that are called wild sailors, and you play as one of them, braving the so-called wild sea for any number of reasons. There are actually a number of things to keep in mind with this setting, and I find this list here both exhilarating and challenging. The excitement comes from the fact that this is one of the absolute most creative and interesting RPG settings I've ever come across. The author Felix Isaacs was inspired in part by China Mieville's Boz Log trilogy, which is a series of novels near and dear to my heart for the very same reason that I love this game. It's just utterly unique and fascinating world building. But this list is also challenging because here's the question, how do you get players on board with this? If you're blessed with players who like to read the rule book before playing, who read novels, and who exercise their imaginations like a bodybuilder pumps iron, then you're in luck. But if you're trying to use this game as a palate cleanser between weekly milk toast fantasy dungeon crawls, you will not penetrate the canopy of this forest of ideas. I don't mean that to be dismissive, it's just that the imagination really is a muscle. You either use it or it atrophies. Maybe this video can help some people who are in between those worlds get read into this setting. There's also a very warm and friendly Discord server for Wild Sea that I'll leave a link for down below. Here's another list of important concepts in the setting. Basically, you have this sea of forest and other plant life that makes up a surface. It's been around for a few hundred years, but people have only been sailing it for about 20 years. People live on mountaintops, enormous trees that are miles tall and thousands of feet around called tall shanks and bits of habitable surface that bubble up to the surface for a few months to a few years at a time called spits. There's this gooey, smelly substance called creserin that oozes out of some trees, and it's an extremely powerful mutagen. If you touch it, it burns your skin, but if you let it sit on your skin, it can mutate you. This whole theme of mutation is vitally important to the setting, actually, because it explains away virtually all the crazy stuff I'm about to show you. There are layers to the Wild Sea. As a wild sailor, you're mostly on the top two layers, the Thrash and the Tangle. For more extreme adventures, you can maybe build a submersible and travel into the Sink, where shipwrecks often get tangled and knotted into the roots and forgotten. Below that are the Drown and the Darkness Under Eaves, where the setting sort of retreats to let you come up with whatever you want. It's down in the darkness under eaves where players can discover once and for all what might have caused the green apocalypse or the verdancy. But that's totally up to your table if and how that sort of thing is ever revealed. So two things about this spread. One, it's not hard to notice that this game is illustrated by insanely talented artists. The art is all remarkably colored and satisfyingly unified in its style throughout the 368 pages of the book. The second thing about this spread is that you instantly realize that this setting is very much a post-human world, where humankind is just one of a plurality of sentient species, or bloodlines as they're called. Humans are called the Ardent, the Cactus people are called Ectus, the Gao are entirely fungal humanoids, the Zelacrae are spider folk, then there are a minority of Ironbound, which are souls that have put together a corporeal body for themselves using spare parts, the Ketra, a new order of human completely changed by the mutagenic Kreserin, and the Mothrin, moth people who have wings but have evolved to the point where they can't really fly. Just to give you an idea of what a ship could look like, here's one. It really can be designed in any way, shape, or form, and there's a whole guide later in the book on how to do it. A ship can actually be a central part of your party's existence to some degree, or you can play this game without worrying about detailing a ship or even using one at all. But the main conceit with a ship here is that they need a way to churn through the overbrush of the tree canopies and some kind of power source to drive the engines that cause the churning action. If I had to sum up the look and feel of the cultures you'll find as you sail about the Wild Sea, I'd say it's a mix of old port towns, rough and tumble survivalism like what you saw in the Matrix sequels, and whimsical fantasy. It's not a gritty picture, but it's messy and patchworked as people cling to rare pieces of solid land, floating bits and pieces of temporary land, and super gargantuan tall shanks. People don't use fire for the most part, since fires can catch in the trees and rage for weeks, months, or years and destroy everything a character knows and loves. So in the alternative, check out these alternatives to cooking with fire that people use. 
This book is filled wall to wall with this level of detail and imagination, by the way, which is why I've been so smitten by it. But again, just taking in this one page of details can be a challenge. As the GM, you want to know this sort of thing about the world when running the game, and as a player, your experience at the table would be so much more enhanced if you also had these details in mind, but it takes reading this stuff and cogitating it. It's an investment for sure. I'm skipping over a fair bit here, but check out the level of technology that this setting wants you to work with. It sort of establishes its own genre niche, a mix of steampunk and solar punk and nautical pirate adventures, all on treetops. Let's call this leaf punk. So as much as I love the setting and the artwork and the shape of the book of this game, really my favorite aspect of it, and the most important in my opinion, is the mechanics. At its core, you can see that it was sort of based on Blades in the Dark by John Harper, but saying that is almost a disservice because it's not even remotely just another Forged in the Dark clone. For example, there are phases of play, in this case scenes, montages, and journeys, and you have timers in the form of tracks. But here's where things get really intensely interesting. These tracks act as more than just timers where you can tick down towards some event or expiration in the narrative. They are used to track all kinds of things, including ability and item usage. Boxes can be semi-permanently X'd out or burned so that it could become a whole side mission just to restore those boxes. And track breaks mark milestone events in the course of a track. As far as the dice mechanic, it's a D6 pool where you add your abilities, skills, and situational or named advantages of any sort and throw that number of dice. If the highest die in your throw is a six, the action is a success. A four or five is a conflict, a one, two, or three is a failure, and any doubles in the throw results in a twist. The twist is the innovation here, not necessarily in that it's a thing where something unexpected happens, but that the GM and other players, not the person rolling, are the ones tasked with coming up with what that thing is. I really love the way this rule enforces collaboration at the table. Another interesting innovation on the dice is the cut. Instead of removing dice before a roll to account for difficulty, precision shots, or increased impact, one or more of the dice are removed after the roll, starting with the highest. This just has a different feel to it, making the cuts feel more gutting and impactful since you're removing actual good roll results. Another really interesting aspect of the rules is stated right here. You'll never die before you're ready. Damage may mount up, injuries may compound, but death on the wilds is a narrative event, not a mechanical one. This philosophy is not for everyone, especially those who are OSR minded or highly dependent on gritty remorseless misfortune emerging from dice rolls. But if you're on the other side of that spectrum like me, you want a good story to keep going and not get sideswiped by a few bad rolls where suddenly a main character is removed from the narrative. This death mechanic is exactly what I want in a game, and I'm glad that it's codified right here in the book. There's an extended discussion on how and when to die in the game, and it essentially revolves around maximizing impact of the story and the character's arc. And of course, since the setting has some fairly heavy spiritual, quasi-magical, and quasi-magitech elements, the character can always return from the dead if it's a good story choice. Combat is handled without initiative or turn order. Players just describe what they want to do and make rolls as needed. Check this out. How long is an action? As long as it needs to be to achieve something important. It's not the length of an action that matters in combat, it's whether you got to do something you enjoyed. I've got to say, I've never read anything like this in a rule book before, at least not in recent memory. I've seen story first talk in books, first and foremost Blades in the Dark, but right here you're actually given a rules framework that puts story and cool combat scenes right at the top of the list of priorities. Montages are one of the three main phases of play of the game. The idea is that everyone pulls back and narrates the shared tale in broader strokes of time. Here's a nice list of examples of what would take place during a montage. Tasks done in montages include the broad categories of exploration, acquisition of resources either by scavenging, hunting, or harvesting, recovery of various aspects by reclaiming boxes on your various tracks, creation of new aspects, which are your abilities, gear, talents, and all kinds of things, and projects, which are a catch-all for any kind of thing your character might work on outside of the mechanical scope of mere aspects. Okay, so what are these aspects anyway? 
A character in Wild Sea can essentially be broken down into attribute ratings, which tell you how many d6s you can add to a roll, drives and mires, which inform you on what your character wants and what hobbles them, and aspects, which are all defined by tracks. Aspects are certainly the most interesting bit about this game from a mechanical perspective because they do so many things. For example, when you roll up a character, you choose aspects from their bloodline, their origin, and their post or job. Those end up being things like talents, special gear, and even little helper NPCs like insect swarms and mechanical drones. Each aspect has usually between two and four boxes at the start. When your character takes damage and it makes sense in the fiction, those aspects are what initially take damage. Their boxes are also marked off when you actually use the aspect, and you can clear the boxes for further use during a montage or some recovery action that seems fair to everyone. You gain experience in the game through merely playing it and picking up milestones. You can describe milestones however you want, but they also act as spendable points. You can spend your milestones to upgrade your aspects in any number of ways. I thought this was such a cool way to level up, just considering all the mechanical possibilities here. It was at this point in the book that I really sat up and realized that Wild Sea was a special animal. When I read about how players can not only choose aspects from anywhere in the book, but are also encouraged to combine and even create new aspects, I realized that this really was the core mechanic from a player's perspective. There's actually a fourth major component to characters called resources, and they come in the form of salvage, specimens, whispers, and charts. You start off with roughly six of these and can risk them to gain advantage on your rolls. Resources don't have tracks actually, they're named items, or ghostly gifts in the case of whispers, that are defined by their name and a descriptive tag or two. Here are the bloodlines on offer in the core rulebook, which I briefly described earlier in the video, and here are the origins that you can choose from. Each of these choices will give you a choice of aspects to start with, which are thematically keyed to your choice. And finally, here are the jobs or posts that you start with. They are all to do with the nautical, leaf punk nature of the game, although some of them definitely seem to have some overlap to me. You can pause the video and take a look for yourself. Just as an example of what you get with any particular bloodline, here's the Gao, which gives you some essential details about the species, some softer narrative things to consider about your character, and options on reimagining them. Then you get about 16 to 20 unique aspects to choose from. Considering how many there are just for this one bloodline, you can imagine how this book ends up containing hundreds of aspects, which by the way, are all available when cooking up a character. You can pick from any list. It's also worth noting that every bloodline, origin, and post has a unique character portrait for you to feast your eyes on and be inspired by. A lot of the difficulty of imagining this world is alleviated by these pretty incredible illustrations. I'm not going to walk through the GM section of this book, but I will say that I found it to be one of those ones that was clearly written by a creator who has played their game extensively. There is a huge amount of wisdom keyed specifically to this game and all its quirks, and there's not much more you can ask for than that. This is a pretty good bulleted list that describes what a prototypical session of Wild Sea looks like to the author. I think it sums up the game pretty nicely. Also some great extended advice on how to use tracks in the game. The last major section of the book is really so overwhelming in its imagination and breadth that it almost needs to be its own book. Not really in terms of its page count, but in the density and impact of the ideas it contains. There are eight subsections listed here in the table of contents, and they're each jam-packed with examples. Just as an example of one of these sections, Forces of Nature contains nine possible threats described here, six more here in a more extended format, including Kreserin, which is arguably the most important natural threat in the entire game, second only to Flame, as well as Rifts, which are large gaps in the root and branch superstructure that can lead to dead drops for your ship. And it just goes on and on. Here are 10 beasts and extended description of beasts accompanied by illustrations. There are actually so many threats across the eight categories here that you can't easily take it all in. But on that same token as a GM, you really need to take the time to read this really dense section of the book because it informs the setting so much and you can't phone it in with Wild Sea. It's just too unique. One other takeaway from this section is that this world is incredibly dangerous and full of nightmarish monsters. 
It's actually quite a prudent choice to make death optional, because otherwise your character would probably just die a horrible death before a cool story could unfold. There are a few interesting extras that I have to mention that exist outside of this book, the first of which is the official first soundtrack to the game by Liam P. Vaughn. The album is called Songs of the Lignan Tide, and it really pretty remarkably invokes the strange and exotic world of Wildsea, all while still sounding vaguely familiar and really quite human. The songs are free to listen to on YouTube, Spotify, and wherever else you might normally find regularly released music. I've listened to the album myself countless times now, and it's just infinitely fascinating. Also, the Discord server is great for Wildsea. The people there are friendly and helpful, and at least at the time of this recording, you can find the creators of Wildsea hanging out there pretty regularly. Also at the time of this recording, the first expansion for Wildsea, Storm and Root, is crowdfunding on Kickstarter. It intends to add new character options, as well as more description of adventures in the air, as well as below the leaves in submersible ships. It will also bring the game to the virtual tabletop Alchemy, which is shaping up to be a very sharp, modern, and elegant online gaming platform. So yeah, I can very comfortably conclude that this is one of the most remarkable games I've ever encountered in terms of its completely unique setting, its evocative art that sells the setting completely, the professional and extremely readable layout, and of course the innovative rules that really seem designed to gamify storytelling without becoming burdensome. I was not able to play this game with the author and publisher Felix Isaacs and Ray Chow prior to this video, but I plan on doing so per their invitation and maybe releasing a follow-up video with my thoughts on how the game actually plays. I'll also link all the actual plays that I can find for this along with any other useful links for things that I've mentioned in this video. And of course, I'll link the written interview I did with Felix and Ray where we deep dive into all the questions I had about the origins of Wildsea, the mechanics, and about Storm and Root. So thanks for watching, and if you'd like to support this channel and keep content like this flowing, please join my Patreon. All right, see ya.